Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parler, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Please say yes. Heaven. There you are! More radiant than ever. Oh my god. Still spoiling her, Milton. I am in a position to help. Financially. I can look after us. Don't be too proud, Will. I had twins, didn't I? Just one beautiful boy. No, I had twins again, I saw. They were mean to me. You had to. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host Matthew Perkovich and this is episode number 304. Out today on DVD and digital is The Bay of Silence, a psychological thriller that stars Klaus Bang and Olga Kirilenko as a married couple who must contend with the ghosts of the past after the death of their newborn child. Featuring powerful performances and an engrossing story, The Bay of Silence also holds an important message about how silence regarding mental illness can lead to tragic results. Joining me now on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is a writer and producer of The Bay of Silence and an acclaimed actor in her own right, Caroline Goodall. Caroline, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Matt. I'm really, really grateful. Um, As uh, you know, we were saying earlier just before um you know i'm really sad i can't be in australia to see all my family and friends and have my red carpet moment with them and to celebrate it's also my mother's birthday today uh so a huge shout out to her um and uh just really grateful to be talking to you and it's very surreal to be rolling this out from my kitchen table in italy (laughs) Trust me, I've been talking to a lot of filmmakers from all around the world, and it, the mm. the feelings are very mutual. It's just a, such a surreal experience, but it's also a good thing to have a movie out um, as well for people to watch, um, especially a movie like Bay of Silence, which I think is just uh, such a great film. And I, I really want to talk about um, it's based on a novel by Lisa St. Auburn de Tarang, and I, I was really interested. What was the first time that you came across uh, that novel yourself? It was actually a number of years ago. Uh, I was in Italy and um, I was filming Cliffhanger, actually. So it was a very long time ago. And uh, the book had been published. She was a very well-known writer at the time. A lot of people were trying to make movies of her work, such as Slow Train to Milan, um, for a long time. And uh, she has a wonderful way of writing it's very haunting very visual and the bay of silence is a place in italy uh la baia del silencio in a little town called sestri levante which is uh right at the beginning of the famous cinque terre in liguria and it's utterly beautiful and uh i was there stopped there on my way down to rome actually and uh uh, was reading the book um and uh it was just beautiful place to read it in and I was so taken by the story it's very character driven um, and uh, the story is about a couple and the central question is for me that grabbed me is what happens when you fall so much in love that you're prepared to not look at clues that point to the fact that your partner might be a very different kind of person Mm. to the one you expect and how far will you go for love and that is the central dilemma in the film um but at the same time the book was quite contemplative and also written from both points of view and i toyed the idea of writing something that could possibly be long-form television series but then um felt no it needs to be more of a mystery thriller and because the lead character of rosalind is um schizophrenic uh that's not a spoiler um ultimately and traumatized from her time um she's not exactly um 
someone who you can rely on as a narrator. So I decided that it would be more interesting to go through the eyes of Will, who is her husband, um, even though the film is especially now extraordinarily contemporary it's me two themes uh it's about motherhood um it's about family um and sexual trauma uh and i think what's been really great is to see that a lot of men are also really responding to this film because um it's affects everyone um, and uh, mental health and, you know, sort of sexual abuse uh, affects everyone in the family. It's not just women. It's not just women who are the victims. Um, and I think it was good to enlarge that conversation. You mentioned before that a lot of people tried to adapt the novels of um, Lisa St. Auburn, the Terrain, mm -hmm. and they haven't achieved that. You have, and I think you're on record of your, your this movie, your Bay of Silence, is the first actual film adaptation of her work. Is there, a, is there any sort of um, uh, weight that comes with that, you think, on, on your part? Is there any sort of kind of like a responsibility being the first person to put her words onto a different medium? Oh, Lord. <laughs> She's an amazing person, and uh, she was just so supportive. Um, she actually... Uh, was living in Italy as well, and uh, I did manage to get to meet her, and I have known her for some time. And uh, she, she just said, just take it away, do what you can with it, um, and let me know. And um, you know, there were a lot of kind of twists and turns, and there was a moment when I lost the rights to the book, and of course, you know, as an actor, there were a lot of other things going on in my life as well. And uh, so I'm just really, really glad that I was able to continue and persevere. There are some things that just itches that you mm. can't stop scratching. And for me, this this book was it. Um, I really love the work of Nick Rogue and Polanski. And I just had that feel for me of Don't Look Now and also George Sluzer, The Vanishing, mm -hmm. um, deal with very similar themes. And these are films that I grew up with and I wanted to see made and I didn't see enough of them being made. And uh, so uh, that was kind of one of the impetuses. Um, I must add, actually, and I just want to give a shout out to um, Sue Maslin and Joss Morehouse and PJ Hogan and Rebecca Gibney and Joanna Murray-Smith, all fantastic, amazing, creative Australians uh, who championed me, actually, and gave advice and help because in 2014, I was shooting The Dressmaker. Yeah. And I was actually staying with Joanna and her family in Melbourne. Um, and um, you know, commuting to the set. And it was just such a wonderfully inspiring set of women. Uh, you know, woman director, woman producer, you know, this great ensemble cast. Um, and uh, it was at that time that I thought, I'm really going to do this. And I talked to Sue about it and asked her, how did you put the dressmaker together? Um, and uh, she gave me a lot of advice. Um, and so it's... I'm just really thrilled that the movie's coming out in Australia now, you know? You mentioned before about how The Dressmaker had a female director, female producer. Same thing with your film, The Bay of Silence. Your director, yeah. Bert Van Der um, de Oost, a Danish <laughs> filmmaker. Um, how did she no, come she's... on board? She's actually Dutch, Dutch. sorry. Apologies. Um, <laughs> okay, she... so we have Place Bang is Danish. Yeah. And I do have a Danish, a wonderful Danish executive producer, Peter Gard, who uh, was probably, I would say, my kind of financial plan guru. He founded Centropa with Lars von Trier. And I thought, my God, if the Scandies, who are so big on Scandi Noir, and, you know, that was sort of taking over the world, I thought if he's interested, mm. then, you know, I'm definitely onto something. So, yeah, we do have the Danes, don't worry. Um, but she's Dutch um, and uh, yeah I you know I, I'd been putting uh, female director names in front of my sales agent for, for a year or two um, and they just mm, no value yeah. you know who else have you got and it really was after Harvey Weinstein I think in 2007 yeah it was, yeah, it was the end of 2017 wasn't it um, and we were at the EFM just at the, you know, in February 2018 and still I'd had a director who unfortunately had to fall out because uh, he was offered an enormous job and you just have to accept that. And 
uh, my sales agent said, what about a woman? And I just looked at him. I was like, yeah, I've been trying to tell you this for a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, suddenly, you know, everything was, the doors were opening and it was just great. So I thought, let's just slip through this one fast. And Paula I had met about a year before and I really loved her film Tonyo and Black Butterflies, which um, were very right for my film. Tonyo is about the loss of a son and what happens to the couple, uh, except he's older, he's a teenager. And um, Black Butterflies is about um, a poet and mental illness. So I thought she really has all the tools at her disposal to be able to tell this story. And Paula very kindly read it. And then she said, yes, I'll come on board. And at that point, we moved very, very fast because we also had the actors who were waiting. And we had that window of opportunity because they were extremely busy. And of course, uh, Brian Cox as well. Can't forget yeah. Brian, who had succession that he had to, to go back to. So you have your cast, you have your director on board. You are a low-budget film and you have all these different locations you have to film on as well. Um, when it comes to not only as a screenwriter but also as a producer on a movie as well, how do you approach uh, the work as in working with your filmmakers and with your actors? Do you collaborate or is it simply a thing of delegating the task, getting the um, filming wrapped up as, qu as quick as you can um, and in the can and get into post? Because I imagine that post-production, above all else, especially consider a movie like this, I th I'd imagine that a lot of it uh, will be made in the editing suite. Yes, that's that's rather a lot of um, questions to unpick, so I'll start. Uh, yes, of course, um, it's it's not often that you have a writer who's also a producer, certainly not in feature films. Um, and I was a first-time producer as well, so I had to um, persuade a lot of people and I really had to, um, you know, make sure that I had a very strong team around me. We needed to be bonded, obviously, uh, by an insurance company to make sure that we were going to deliver the film. There were just so many, um, uh, you know, things that you had to look at. Uh, so I worked closely with Paula on the script, um, and, uh, then, uh, said, take it away. Um, I was very happy about that. You know, I had quite enough as a producer. We had to close finance. We had, you know, some cash flow issues. They're always going to be there. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, in TV, you often get producer writers, but you don't tend to in features. And uh, it's very much a director medium. And I think it's very important to let the you know director know that you totally trust them um, and that it's their film. Um, so... Uh, you know, I still woke up every single morning having to put out, put, to put out a thousand fires. And yes, of course, there were rewrites. And uh, yeah, there were some moments um, when, you know, things actually, you know, logistically weren't necessarily going to be serving the script. So, you know, we had to, to think on our feet. But I've been very fortunate in that I've made so many films over the years of so many different budgets. And I do think... Um, that really helped because I think if you have a real working knowledge of, of a set and also people's mindsets, not just um, from a production point of view, but from the actor's point of view and, uh, you know, even the designers um, and logistics, um, it helps you make decisions that are going to hopefully be the right ones for the movie. And there were loads of them. I would wake up terrified every single morning. Mm. Uh, you know, I think about the only nice thing I liked was the fact that I could take my own calls because as an actor, it's like, okay, you've got a 5.30 call and then you know, it's like, oh God, maybe I can actually sleep in and get to the set at eight, you know. <laughs> that was nice. The book itself came out, was first, first released in 1986 and we've talked about how a main theme of the movie is about mental illness, especially the character of Rosalind. She's a, a schizophrenic. In that 34 years from when the book is released to the movie is out now, I'm sure there's been a lot of different research and a lot of different uh, um, uh, findings about the nature of the disease of schizophrenia. Did you have to find that you had to make changes in regards to how 
the uh, disease itself um, was to be represented in the movie? Um, did you have to do a lot of research on the subject and make sure that everything was kind of up to date into how um, the character of Rosalind would react in her movie? Um, I think that's a tricky one because actually there has been a lot of research, but the thing about schizophrenia is it's such an umbrella term mm. for a variety of mental health issues. Um, so, you know, schizophrenia can you know, we now know can be just in your DNA um, and also it can be triggered. And in her case, it was definitely triggered by uh, childhood uh, trauma. Um, but the film is a thriller as well. And, you know, ironically, I looked, I actually looked up. Um, it's amazing how many movies are about mental illness yes. and mental health. Uh, it, it, actually probably most of the canon of horror movies that are out there and most many psychological thrillers as well um so uh i think it's, this is a character driven drama and um this is not about a woman and her steps of her mental illness and uh, treatment um so it's about a lot more than that and of course it's also about the death of a child and how you deal with that um so um i would i don't think that the treatment of it has would have uh, been any different uh no quite honestly over the you know 30 years actually isn't very long certainly not for um any kind of research into mental health something I, I think though that does stand the test of time in in it definitely in regards to mental illness is re regards to the silence surrounding the disease um i know here in australia that we often have um it's an open discussion asking people to always come out and speak about whether they're feeling depressed or feeling uh, lonely or anything uh, in, in those regards and there's a pivotal scene in the movie where um uh will um talks to rosalind's mum and in in pretty much says you know why didn't anyone tell me about this if i knew about this then not a lot of these things that happened in the movie wouldn't happen and, and i guess it's really important that uh and, and i think it shows in the movie that it's important that people talk about uh this is um, mental illness especially if you're a sufferer of it well you've actually hit that completely right on the head and of course the film is called the bay of silence and it is about the silence that you keep when you are unable to talk about things that have affected you so deeply um and that is exactly what has happened to her and in turn what starts happening to him because by burying the truth um you know he has silenced himself as well and so the whole movie is also about secrets and lies um and uh it's about family and how well do you know your partner and how far will you go to protect your partner and most importantly what happens if you do bury the truth uh so as we all know denial is such um a corrosive um problem in society uh, in general not just with mental health um you know we're even seeing that in contemporary society now you know how you can you know have people who tell you to your face that what you see is the truth is not the truth you know you're being gaslit mm. um and uh, so the bay of silence deals with all of that as well um and uh, you know i wanted to create a thriller that you know satisfies audiences while going deep i wanted to make a sophisticated film with strong thematics and stay true to the genre um and there were you know also numerous homages in there to hitchcock and of course to nick rogue and to polanski mm. um that don't look now is a great inspiration for the film um and also i think visually um you know what Paula and Guido van Genep did uh, visually is really wonderful as i said it was a you know very low budget movie it looks so much bigger we went to three different countries um and uh, you know they were we wanted a kind of throwback kind of classic feel and our three actors are real archetypes they're just wonderful you know they do look like you know sort of hitchcock hitchcock style sort of movie stars but with a twist of the 70s in there as well and of course very contemporary and certainly in the acting very contemporary um and you know it's quite a balance to um 
have to tread. And they just took it on magnificently. You know, some of these scenes are so demanding. And I remember Clace and Olga both saying, I don't know how we're going to go there. Um, and just very gently and very delicately Paula you know took them through um and uh you know that I just love that central uh time in in Normandy where you know the film in a way is sort of divided into three and it starts very kind of upbeat and we're in this sort of magical you know place of love um, and respite, um, which is Italy and the Bay of Silence itself, and it's golden. And then you move into London where, you know, it's kind of busy and vibrant and, you know, their life is upbeat. And then by the time we get to that central time in Normandy, we're moving into a very gothic kind of place and um, the lensing gets starker. And actually we found this amazing house up on a cliff. Uh, it was actually St. Abbs up in Scotland, uh, which is, which um, we had, uh, we had Scotland doubling for Normandy. And all these seagulls constantly wheeling around and, you know, screeching and screaming. And, uh, you know, these kind of jagged black rocks. Um, and it just was so kind of psycho and Hitchcock of the birds that it was just so perfect. And, you know, those tropes were there on purpose. You know, you, you know, the audience is incredibly sophisticated and we're saying, go with us uh, into, we're now going down a rabbit hole and we want you to follow us. Uh, suspend some of your disbelief and here we go. And um, it's quite thrilling, I think, um, at that moment where you see this kind of twist. So, so while the film is extremely uh, naturalistic as well, um, it also has this heightened sort of reality too, which I think uh, is very, very right for the genre. It is very right for the genre and it is a fantastic film. So everyone out there listening, The Bay of Silence out on DVD and digital, there's actually a website everyone could go to as well, thebayofsilencefilm.com, and that has a link there for all the different places you can watch online. And I really do recommend everyone watch it. Uh, the performances especially are fantastic in this film. And Caroline Goodall, I thank you very much for your time today. Congrats with the movie. And um, hopefully we get to talk again in the future with future projects. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Oh, thank you, Matt. I'm really, really grateful. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope I made some sense. <laughs> it was fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.